Hello, and you're listening to the Invest in Denver podcast. I'm Minju. And I'm Erland, and we have both lived, moved away, and now are back in Denver. And our favorite current dinner spot to take our friends to is Super Mega Bien. Yeah. Nice. It's a restaurant that serves Mexican fusion food, but in dim sum style. Yeah. Oh, what? Seriously? Dude, how have I never yeah. heard yeah. of this place? Super Mega Bien? <laughs> so good yeah. it's funny how so like it, it's like a uh, butchering of uh spanish and english at the same time and all of a sudden you toss <laughs> in this dumpling aspect of it like that was something i never even expected so tell us a little bit more about it like i'm curious myself what is this dumpling style mexican fusion place like so um so dim sum you know is like a chinese cuisine so like the way uh i'm i'm not chinese but um I, the way i understand it is that um like little plates are brought up to share for the whole table. So when you're sitting at this restaurant, um, you don't actually order. They just like drive around a little, they'll come by with a little cart and ask you, do you want these ribs? Or do you want, does your table want an order of these um, potatoes? But they're, so it's like, that's the style, but the food itself is like Spanish and Mexican, I think. Interesting, mm -hmm. I love it. And where is this? It's in Rhino. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the intersections all, all that well, but I yeah, it's somewhere in there. Super it. nice though. I feel like yeah. all the cool spots are in Rhino and maybe like a little bit on the outskirts of the perimeter of Rhino, but nonetheless, like I feel like I need to have a spot, like an apartment in Rhino in order to really experience like the the fusion, the cool foods and all that good stuff and even the art of it all. So the Rhino art yeah. uh, situation is pretty sweet. But thank you so much, guys, for sure. even being on the Investor De Invest in Denver podcast. I mean, I can't even say my own podcast right. But this is a <laughs> sick uh, event. I know I've known you guys for a while now. You're one of my, um, I guess, oldest friends here in the Denver area. So I am truly <laughs> blessed to even have you guys or even know you guys at the same time. So stoked on it. And Aww. we have a lot to cover here. We have a lot to talk about as far as the culture goes, what you guys like to do. And even your upbringing is pretty unique uh, coming into the Denver scene. So I guess we'll get started. I guess like having Minju go first and we'll talk about uh, Erlin's childhood going into it. But uh, I guess Minju, I know when I first met you um, that... It was funny when we first talked to each other. Um, a lot of the pop culture references, I had no idea that you didn't know much of them, like Star Wars or like certain things that uh, I thought everyone knew about. You just didn't <laughs> understand or like it just didn't click. And that had something to do with like your the grade school you went to. Uh, could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So um, a lot of people in uh, like the... Denver metro area probably have heard of Waldorf schools, but because there's three in the area, but I went to Shepherd Valley It's like a little Waldorf school in Niwot, um, all the way K through eight. And then actually even to Waldorf high school, um, at a school of 60 kids in Boulder. So my graduating class was 13. So very, very tiny. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, a big feature of Waldorf school is the lack of technology. So I wasn't really allowed to uh, watch movies, listen to music uh, that wasn't like live. So like classical live concerts were fine, but nothing besides that. Um, and then and uh, very encouraged to do more like art, um, like sports, um, I guess more that or literature. A lot. I did a lot of reading growing up, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's definitely different. Um, the pop culture part, when I went to college, I had to catch up on everything within like, you know, a couple months. <laughs> so I think my music, I especially noticed it in my music because like I was like listening to like 2000 songs being like, this is so good. And people were like, that's been out for like a decade. <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty embarrassing, but it was, uh, um, I guess that was like the downside right being behind pop culture references even now yeah erlin makes a lot of like um movie jokes mm -hmm. that i'm like just goes right over my head <laughs> um but uh i think the benefits definitely is that like the lack of technology made me very like i think creative and like mm -hmm. how to spend my time so uh when i was younger like before i got a smartphone i remember having like a folder of projects like i was like writing a play i was like you know, I had like a book I wanted to write. I was, I ran like a summer camp for kids when I was like 14 and I, and like the parents paid me like a little bit and we put on like a little play. Um, and also I played a lot outside with my neighborhood friends. 
So I had like that kind of like, I guess, ideal 90s childhood, but like a little later, like in the 2000s. So mm. um, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, I find that um, the, the aspect that really blew me away was that you wrote a play when you were in K through eight. And I right. did not even think about, I mean, writing a book, writing a story <laughs> in itself just seems so far-fetched to me and just unattainable. And here you are just like, yeah, I wrote a couple plays like K through eight, like, <laughs> nothing big. <laughs> like it was no big deal. Like you guys didn't write yeah. plays as well. Like <laughs> you can imagine how like my adjusting to making friends in college might've been a little tough at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Waldorf school. So, I mean, I myself, um, of course, like I grew up in like a private school, like from mm -hmm. elementary school, middle school and even high school as well but i mean as far Sorry. as like waldorf schools that's pretty rare if you ask me i haven't met anyone else that went to a school like that so are they nationwide is there a couple in denver in itself and you went to the one in boulder right there are yes so i went to tara performing arts high school in, in boulder um and then there are a lot of Waldorf schools nationwide i think there's over well i guess not a ton but i think it's about 140 probably don't quote me on that number probably more at this point um but I think what's really crazy about older schools is that the graduates have this really high rate of life satisfaction, mm. actually. So 95% of Waldorf grads, that they did a study, I think, of like a, like a few hundred of them. And they have a really high rate of satisfaction in the job that they choose. And also, like out of my high school class, only three of us went to college immediately. A lot of them took a year off. So I think that like... Um, our education was definitely weird, but it made us constantly question, like, is this something that I want like, is like after high school when something kind of everyone it, like peer pressured me to do something. I felt like I wasn't easily peer pressured mm -hmm. because I was like, I'm used to being the odd person who went to a weird school. Mm -hmm. I don't like this. So I'm not going to do that. Or even like in my job, like um, if I didn't like something, I would like speak up about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a interesting trait that like Waldorf grads tend to have. Going against the norm and against the grain. I like that aspect of it, to be right. honest. I mean, um, when you look at that satisfaction, and there's some studies out there that I heard myself where like a lot of what the depression comes from, anxiety comes from, it's all about that connectivity with everyone around the world. Mm -hmm. Social media, I mean, everything being yeah. instant gratification. And here you are not having that close tie to technology and you have a much, I guess... Um, more fruitful life after afterwards so i maybe there's some sort of correlation there you know that lack of technology equals a better foundation for life going forward yeah do you feel like that's a big attributor to that or something else i i mean yeah i think so and i think also a huge part is that like when you don't have technology constantly like you know like i feel like my phone is constantly telling me something that i want to check right like a notification all of us are um, when you don't have that aspect, like I remember you ha you're forced to use your creativity because mm. you have nothing around you. So like I've always heard creativity comes from nothing. Mm. And I think right now a lot of us don't have the state of nothing anymore, like hardly ever. So um, but I find it really weird that like, for example, I know that the like the children of CEOs like Apple and like another, I think Microsoft, they send their children to all their schools in the Silicon Valley area. And that's very strange because they are the tech you know, tech mm. icons who made these this products, but um, they're saying that they want their kids to learn that creativity. So mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty interesting that, that that they're making that choice. Yeah. And it, luckily your parents caught it in like beforehand and you were the cool kid before these CEOs yeah. brought their kids to the schools. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's pretty, Maybe. that's pretty yeah. sweet. I mean, um, I mean, I'm open to a whole, like seeing what the options are, um, I mean, I myself, uh, I know talking with Kat as well, like eventually we want to be parents, you know, um, mm -hmm. what does that education look like? Are we going to homeschool them? Are we sending them to the public school? I mean, even Waldorf school, I mean, like sounds right. like what you've experienced is something that a lot of parents want for their kids going forward. I mean, we want yeah. to see them succeed and be fruitful in whatever endeavor they go to, you know? So right. with that being said, I mean, I'm curious about you, Erland. I mean, I know you grew up in the North Carolina area and moved over to the mm -hmm. Denver area as well. At what point did that happen? And did you have family already here in Denver? Um, I did have family in Denver. I, I didn't know about them like early on. I, um, so what brought us out to North Carolina was my dad. He got a job out there and, and then we just kind of follow wherever he went from Mexico. 
came went to North Carolina and said I think when I was like five before then uh, a couple other states but yeah we, that's where I grew up um, uh, and the family in Denver I kind of just met when I was like 16 17 uh, just visiting family we were, we were just we got bored of going to Disney <laughs> no nah, we just went to uh, Florida Myrtle Beach stuff like that and then my mom was like hey I have uncles and aunt uh, or brothers and sisters in Colorado so just came to visit nice and you sort of stuck yeah. around but i know at a certain point you uh you know we eventually met over in the terracon era um era <laughs> it's almost like a right. stage yeah. of my life you know like yeah. the whole environmental <laughs> consulting <laughs> geology background to it but i know you were kind of in a different department i know you were more in the like asbestos uh, mitigation things mm. like that but you did some odd jobs even within like the company itself so um right. i guess what drew you to terracon or like what's what sort of qualifications did you have to eventually go into almost the same, um, I guess, occupation as me as a geologist? Uh, well, at first I was, what got me into it was my dad. My dad is a, um, for a while he was an instructor for asbestos m mitigation and um, kind of like air quality control and stuff like that. He did that for about like eight years. And I, at, at a certain point in my life, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. I, di I knew I didn't like what I was doing currently. And so I asked him what he did and then he told me and, and he said that I could learn from the ground up, you know, or I could go to school. And so he got me into the company. I started working as an abatement worker in asbestos, worked my way up. And then after like a year or two, um, I just got enough um, experience to kind of start applying for an environmental consultant job um it was it was more the the what got me like so much experience was being able to speak english and also having a social security number because mm. most workers didn't have it and you know that's why i got up but uh yeah that's kind of what drew me in there i i just knew my dad always liked his job i didn't like mine so uh i just took that route and and stuck with it for like three years until i got to terracon nice for sure and then uh, i'm curious yeah. um i what you're doing now and why you decided to move over to um what you're doing now and then we'll go over to minju what you're doing okay uh so now i'm currently a dental hygienist i that's actually what i was doing when i didn't like what i didn't like when i got, got me into <laughs> environmental consulting but uh i got me back into it because one the hours are really good to pay is really good and i it allows me to work on endeavors that i have you know and here you know without money or um it's time available like i don't know i don't know if it, you remember but like in terracon we we'd be working from like 5 a.m to like <laughs> 9 p.m yeah. you know and and I mean, pay isn't like what it is in hygiene. So sure. it just took a lot of time away and, and yeah, got, got more money. So that's yeah. kind of why I came back to hygiene. I, I feel you on that, man. Like that was something I did not, uh, I was not jealous of. Like when I was doing it in yeah. San Diego, that was one thing, you know, like being outside, working with my hands, working with rocks and things like that. And then every once in a while I would be on the next county over or maybe even Arizona, you know? But the thing is, is that right. it's constantly... 70 degrees and higher <laughs> but like working, <laughs> Great in the, weather. <laughs> working in the winter time like my hands were frozen dude like i don't know if you see my hands oh, but like gosh. my fingers are long and like by the time <laughs> at the end of the day my fingertips were numb i'm surprised i don't have frostbite you know so a lot of this stuff like just contributed to me like reassessing like what the heck do i actually want and i pretty quickly mm. quit terracon uh for real estate. So that's a whole different conversation, yeah. but let's say for you, Minju, uh, what led you to what you're doing right now and yeah, how are you enjoying it? Okay. So, um, I got, this was, it was my first job out of college. So I, I started as a recruiter. Um, I did recruiting for, I would say about like, uh, like eight months or so. And then actually I, I happened to get into like the sales part of that. So I moved, I started talking more to like the clients, um, instead of talking to candidates. So, you know, in a recruitment company, you're, so you're like finding, um, candidates for jobs. 
um, for that the companies give you. So I became like the contact point for the companies. And then um, I started getting more clients like for my, or, like through my account management, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that for the past, um, I guess like a little over three years. So yeah, um, I really, so I like the part that is, uh, has to do with like client relations. So we recently had a business trip to New York where we visited about eight clients there that I have and I got to meet them in person for the first time. Hmm. Um, it was really cool to like make the make those, I guess, connections. Um, but I guess, yeah, that's the part that I really do enjoy. The part that I maybe, uh, you know, it's still like, it can be a grind recruitment can be tough and also like the economy affects it a lot so like the job market can be really hot for candidates it can be really hot for companies or it can just be like everyone's scared because of a coming recession potentially you know mm -hmm. so yeah that's like the ups and downs but for the most part it's been good nice i i can definitely attest to the whole uh meeting people in irl in real life where yeah. you are for the longest time like a lot of my clients even like nowadays um, we can only see each other via zoom and it takes a while for mm. even now, like even post COVID, like, yeah, sure. Zoom is such a great way to get connected with people without even having to meet in person. It's kind of nice. And yeah. all you have is either zoom or your email signature that has your profile picture. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> but yeah, when, exactly. when you actually meet them in person, it's like, okay, now I got this deeper understanding of who you are, that relationship. And you can even make inside jokes when you meet in person yes. as well. So. <laughs> further develop that relationship. So I know it's just not you two guys living in the house too. You have a third member of the fam, Tori, um, who is your precious dog. And I had the blessing to come over to you guys' place and be blessed with Tori's uh, lovely host uh, <laughs> attributes. And I know it's not often, and this is something that I take pride with, Tori just sat on her lap and was just like wagging his tail and just super excited to see us. And you guys said, he does not do that to everyone. So, ah, oh, that felt so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when that you Tori and, uh, and how long have you had him? I mean, tell us more about him. Um, so we've had him for two years now. Mm, yeah, I think it was, he was definitely a COVID dog. So we got him August mm -hmm. of 2020. August, 2020. Like, uh, it was like right when we were moving from Atlanta down to here but uh got him at boulder humane society um we had been looking for a while but uh didn't couldn't really like find one because I mean, you had it had to be like <laughs> one that loved us you know that yeah. wasn't just like for everyone <laughs> yeah we had this argument because so Erlen really wanted to get a rescue. I agreed. I wanted to get. A, we both wanted to get a rescue because there's plenty of dogs out there that are homeless, right? Mm. So then, but then Erlen thought that meant we should just take any dog that we meet first on site. <laughs> and I was like, I did not feel that way because we met a dog and the dog did not like us very much. Okay, right. And then he wanted to take it home, but I, and I was kind of like, okay. But I wasn't sure about it. And then um, when you met Tori, he was really tiny. He was like, uh, like I think he was like less than 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. They he told us, the yeah, they told us he was going to be a dachshund. So like a sausage dog. So like small. Right. <laughs> and I was like, perfect. We have an apartment. I want a small dog. He's, yeah. He seems cute, you know, and, and also he really loved us. Yeah. So from the beginning, he like was really attached to, to both of us. And yeah. then. Um, What's hilarious, though, is like we were asking for all his siblings. We were like, are, are the siblings taken as well? Because, like, you know, we didn't know about Tori. He looked a little ugly, you know. But uh, he was ugly. He was, he was pretty ugly. It was like he was gotten beat up. So I was like, all right, maybe the other ones. But, yeah, it ended up being him. And, um, yeah, it was, we, we, we thought it was going to be a small dog. We left for Atlanta, came back, like, two weeks later. Its paws were, like, twice the size. And yeah. now he's, like, a 60-pound boy. So. Yes. Definitely I would not never a have signed up for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. I yeah. think the vet says it might be like a ridge, Rhodesian Ridgeback yes. mix, mm -hmm. which I, I didn't know what they were. Apparently, it's like some South Africa dog. He looks like a Rhodesian Ridgeback, um, if, yeah. if people know what they um, what they look like. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're those uh, dragons in Harry Potter, right? That definitely sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Rhodesian kind of gargoyle -y. Gargoyle -y. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just has like a oh. gothic kind of name to it. It's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, yeah. Like, as far as rescues go, it's almost like 
you're buying something that has a past that you have no idea what happened with the dog, you know? I mean, it sounds like yeah. you got uh totally like at a, such a young age that you're still able to like yeah. uh grow up with him and like teach him like mm -hmm. everything that he should know about the world. Like every not every human is bad, but you know, uh mind your manners and things like that. So uh, I, I know you guys are pretty active in the Denver community or even in the mountains and things like that. So, and you take Tori on these pretty cool trips. Like, is there any in particular mm -hmm. that he was just, he just lit up or loves swimming? What, what about him? Or I guess, what does he like most about the trips that you guys go on? Definitely not the car rides. Yeah, he has <laughs> car anxiety. <laughs> but um, um, we took him to Moab uh, when we were, uh, when he was pretty young, like yeah. when he was about like six months old. So yeah. that was a special trip, I think, because like, was. he was his first road trip. Yeah, he was the guard dog, you know. He, he definitely took the took the role, <laughs> stayed up all night, nice. that kind of thing. Trooper. I, I think he I think he enjoys being like a guard, mm. definitely. <laughs> but like. Also, he's like a, the biggest chicken. <laughs> but yeah. uh, he also loves he loves uh, like meeting other dogs wherever we're at. It's very social. very social, yeah. yeah. So uh, and also he did a hike um, up in Sedona. We took him this time, yeah. and he did this hike where like people had to like climb up these stairs, and like there was like a line because everyone was so like worried. There are a lot of older people, mm -hmm. and then he just like jumped up and did like, me past, up yeah <laughs> so he likes climbing loves nice. climbing loves the outdoors yeah yeah i would say that you know getting a rescue here in the colorado area uh i can't think of many other better places to have a rescue um there's something for, for everyone sure. including dogs there's something for every dog out there so i love it i love the aspect of the whole thing for but sure. i mean a, i mean along with your socialness the culture i mean it seems like you guys have well integrated into the whole denver scene i mean including that like you guys uh, for the longest time i had no you get no idea you guys did this but you guys are salsa dancers and you guys are <laughs> like avid at that and just love it you know so where do you guys go i mean what even drew you to salsa dancing um so i guess it was more like thing something that i really enjoyed so i thought like um erlin would uh, he told me he liked to dance, but then when we started dancing, we realized that he dances cumbia, which is like a Mexican style of dancing. Right. Mm. And then I started dancing salsa actually in high school because um, a lot of my friends at the Tara Performing Arts High School, um, they would go on Thursdays to this place called the Avalon in Boulder. So the Avalon is really great because it's great for beginners, actually. I would recommend it to anybody because it has no bar. So it literally, like, nobody is drinking, really. So it's actually, and it's a very um, welcoming environment for newcomers. Mm -hmm. But about, like, I think anywhere between 150 to 200 people show up every Thursday. Mm -hmm. It is a wow. big event every yeah. Thursday. You pay for a lesson if you want to. You can start at 7.30, do an hour lesson, and that's where you learn a lot. And then the rest of the night is social dancing. But none of it involves drinking, which is really different than some other venues. Um, and that's where I learned a lot of my um, like salsa dancing. And then I went to college, and then I ended up joining like a team there. And that's when like salsa really became something that like I connected with a lot of people You know, through the team. I made a lot of friends there. And then um, ever since then, I've kind of kept it as like a semi somewhat weekly thing that I like to do. And now, you know, since we've been together for the last three or over three years, um, we've been also doing it together. But it was different. You can talk yeah. about the difficulty. <laughs> yeah. So so like you mentioned previously, like, so I thought I was an OK dancer. I, I I'd went to this like the other venues, not uh, Avalon, but like this one called Roomba. It's it's uh it's in Denver. It's it's a bar and they have like a salsa. They have like a no, not a salsa. But they have a live band, mm -hmm. like a whole dance floor. It's pretty cool. And um, I'd gone there and, you know, I I thought I was doing OK at dancing. You know, like <laughs> nobody would nobody would tell me my I was off step or whatever. And uh, yeah, but basically I was doing like other moves, cumbia moves. And then when I met Minju, she, I, I, you know, she's like way up here, like <laughs> in like level compared to me. Like, so I definitely, it's been a learning curve. Like, I think a lot, like I, we went to the Avalon together and I was, I got thrown out of the advanced group. <laughs> some lady, some lady said, um, 
the intermediate group is that way. <laughs> and I was I was like, okay, all right. <laughs> but they're, but, but not, they're not like it? that to anybody except for if you're trying to join the advanced group. Yeah, so I just trying, want to make it clear. <laughs> Minju was yeah. like, yeah, you'll be fine in advance. No. <laughs> and so, yeah, I went to the intermediate and then just kind of like floated there and learned some stuff. And now, I mean... We get by, you yeah. know. We get now by. we have a lot, a lot of fun. I think. But yeah. it, it's uh, salsa is in itself like a interesting dance because like it's like like any other dance, you, you the group is only as good as the male, uh, the lead, you know, mm. and the 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 female could be the greatest follow, whatever. But if you're not, you're, the male isn't leading right, mm. the dance does not look good. <laughs> so it's a lot of pressure, but uh, definitely, you know still learning <laughs> yeah I've, I've noticed that too like uh i myself like i don't consider myself an avid dancer i enjoy it i feel like i'm just like uh -huh. an enjoyer and that's about it you know um uh. the biggest thing is that i i've even seen some really good leads that would bring up the follows that are mm -hmm. just not as good but j just because Ooh. they lead so well they uh, just make them look good on the dance floor you know yes and that's yes. for sure I, I feel like that's a lot of well I guess pressure to me, like I, I hardly know how to follow or lead just because um, like I know the steps, I know certain steps and like certain dances. The thing is like certain pushes, certain pulls, certain like mm. movements, um, like just mean different things. Uh, I don't mm. know, dude, maybe I'm just overcomplicating it and you just got to feel the music. I, I think, <laughs> I think you're right on. I think you're right on. It's, it's a lot of, you know, I mean, I mean, I don't know. She teaches me, but like, <laughs> it's a lot of how you, how you like push them or how you ask for their hand. Yeah. And, and like, you have to, I think there has to be like a certain level of confidence in it as well. Yeah. So that the woman can feel like, okay, you want me to do a cross body lead or yeah. you want me to do a turn. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's like the unsaid type of movements. But yeah, it's definitely, it, it, it takes some learning. But I think once you learn a couple of things, you just walk, run with it, you know? Yeah, it's a whole new yeah, I think to body language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, also like, um, because the woman, like the, or the follow, it could be a man as well. Yeah. Um, The follow doesn't have to know uh, any, like, any, they don't really have to know a lot of things. As long as the lead, like you said, it knows what they're doing. Right. So I think it falls on the the leads to learn more things. That's like the tough part. Like mm -hmm. you guys have to actually have to take lessons and like, you know, learn moves. But after that, it's like, you know, it, it's like feeling the music and just having fun as well. Yeah. So. yeah. Like having that foundational experience of like, okay, like these are the certain steps. These are the certain moves. And then once you get the foundational experience, you can see what other people are doing and like mm. just guide, you know, experiments while you're on the dance floor with other people, you know, yeah. other follows. So for sure. Yeah. I, I guess the two places that you recommend are Roomba and Avalon. I mean, it sounds like you guys um, have this uh, mentality between or between both of them where Roomba has more of this like bar feel, but you know, having a good time, get loosened up with some drinks, but Avalon is more like, okay, you're there to dance, learn some moves. Let's, you know, let's practice our skills a little bit more. Yeah. Is that the kind mm -hmm. of feel to both? Yeah, I would say that for sure. So yeah, Avalon is more like dance school, but it's a lot of people. So it still feels like a very social event. Yeah. And then yeah. um, La Rumba is they will play salsa, merengue, and bachata. So like three types mainly and some cumbia. And then um, so you'll do just Latin dancing. Another place that if you're like not super into like doing partner dancing, but you still like that Latin feel is blue ice, blue ice yeah. so there's this like club in on broadway and um they do more like reggaeton and some salsa some cumbia but mostly i would say like latin. songs that anybody can dance to yeah. that are latin yeah latin fusion mm -hmm. love it and you seems yes. to me that you guys like to get your sweat on and speaking of sweat um you know like i know you guys are pretty active in the sports game too like your rec leagues you know I feel like it's a really good way to meet friends, make new friends, and just hang out with people that are, you know, just enjoying the sports scene. So I know you guys for were sure. in the soccer league for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, how did you even hear yeah. about this league? Uh, I, I've, I've had like, so since I came out here, like first time to live out here, that's how I kind of got into the communities. And so I've had friends for like five years, six years that they're, they're well entwined in that. And they, they actually invited me when I told them I was back. They were like, all right, come on. We got a league, you know, this and that. And there's a couple areas like uh, that particular league. I think the one you're talking about is called the, it's at the Eddie. 
um but yeah it's a co-ed league uh at that time we were just trying to do more sports together and uh because i was doing salsa i was mm. like hey since i'm doing salsa you do some soccer <laughs> um Deal. but yeah that was the trade-off and so we we did a, a league there um a friend of ours had told us that they were still going on um and yeah i mean we didn't do bad i think we did like third place or something like that out of three yeah, we didn't do great <laughs> <laughs> pretty much pretty much yeah. not great. it was i so i i particularly like the team wasn't like a star stud because i didn't want minju to feel like it was like intense yeah and so we a lot did of first time a lot of first timers cool. like um i just i i kind of played goalie and let them do their thing and and you know when we won we won when we lost you know good to go team you know yeah yeah. Even her dad played. Her her dad was on the team. <laughs> that's cool. Briefly. Briefly. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. I mean, um, I, I noticed that like, and maybe you guys can attest to this too, but I really like this one um, proverb. It's you learn more about a person over an hour of mm -hmm. game versus a day of conversation. You know, you mm -hmm. learn so much about, about a person, like what they're, what their flow is, the competitive spirits, like their camaraderie and things like that. So I find that to be like such a good way to like make friends at the same time and understand the culture. I mean, shoot, even after the game, I know with certain rec leagues that I was joining back in San Diego or even here in Denver, it's like, yeah, the game happens, but like, let's go get some beer afterwards. You know, <laughs> like that's, that part is where you truly like, okay, what are you all about? That was a cool game and everything. And it gives you like a talking point to start bonds with those friends, you know? So is there mm -hmm. any sort of yeah. like, uh, I guess, places you guys like to go afterwards to build up those calories that you burned? <laughs> um, I don't think with that league, we did that very much because the games were very late. They were at like 10. Oh, for sure. So we really didn't have, um, yeah. I also think that like, it's not so like you wish that every team that you join is going to be this, you know, new group of friends, but it doesn't happen with every, every single team we've realized yeah. because, um, so this is my third season with basketball at, um, Volo. So mm. mile high, you see mile high sports. It's like the biggest sports league in Denver area. Um, it's my third season and the first season that team there's like nobody that I talked to from that team because mm -hmm. none of us really hung out it was like you know none of us had any much team spirit it felt like <laughs> but then the 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 team that I joined afterwards this is actually like our third season yeah. together so I guess it's like upcoming on fourth season then for me awesome. but um but then yeah with that with that this group like we've gone like rafting together outside of this like arranged like um like barbecues or game or game nights and then also like gone to like some bars um so yeah it's just i think it's about finding like the right team that you fit in with and it might not happen every time but it definitely will like um open you to the possibility of meeting those people too yeah i like sure. that it gives the possibility you know and once you find that mm -hmm. true group of friends you're like guys let's sign up for a league together we might suck but whatever that's kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> it's so much better when you like the people <laughs> yeah yeah I dig it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like going out to games is one thing, but like the food scene in Denver, and I know you guys love the, I mean, super mega BN. I mean, that in itself, I've never even heard of even that concept. It's <laughs> super cool. I know with, um, <laughs> after we did some mountain biking together, uh, Erland, uh, we went to yeah. a really good barbacoa food truck over in the Lakewood area. Yeah. Um, this was right yeah. after green mountain. I mean, it was funny, like green mountain had these <laughs> gnarly ridges and I would say we were going to like 45 degrees, that sort of angle and yeah. was oh struggling. I was like, I hope Erland Out is struggling gate. as much <laughs> as me right now. <laughs> Thankfully we were, we yeah. were struggling the same. <laughs> we were at that same, like we're okay at mountain biking. That's about it. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, yeah. as far as the barbacoa food truck, I mean, it was dope. So uh, tell us a little bit more about it and what's what's the name of it. Okay, so that one is called Barbacoa Loso. Um, that's actually my, so it's not my cousin's per se. It's my cousin's husband's family's food truck Cool. and it, business. They, they, now they have a standalone restaurant and I think like six other food trucks, but um they're doing great. They uh that one that was parked in Lakewood, yeah, it was like uh or South Denver, I say, I don't know. It's like Federal and Evans. Okay. But um cool 
cool spot. I, they only do barbacoa, you know, and that's kind of what I like about them. I, I like those food trucks that, you know, stick to their game and, you know, do it well. Yeah. Um, but that one is the, that one I've gone to sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's good um, whenever I go to a restaurant in Denver, uh, except for Indian and Thai, I always get the spiciest salsa because I feel like Denver just doesn't have that quality of spice, like extreme hot at like other restaurants <laughs> is like mild, you know, I'm so used to like Mexican food or like, um, just food that like has a real kick to it and makes me sweat. Like I want to sweat if I'm getting spicy food, right. you know, but like Heck yeah. that, like that place, Barbacoa del Oso, it was it was legit. I, I really enjoyed the yeah. pork tacos that I got and the, the sauce was really good and spicy. So it had everything I wanted out of like a taco uh, food truck. So uh, big props. I like it. Heck yeah. 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 As far as, um, I mean, keeping on this like uh, food train, I know Minju, uh, your mom owns Cup of Peace over in the Boulder area. I mean, I myself yeah. have not had the pleasure of checking it out myself, but I mean, <laughs> looking at the website and I remember that you guys went there a couple of times already uh, based on your Instagram stories. I was like, dude, this place looks dope. Uh, I mean, the organic Korean food and the teas, the boba and everything like that. So um, I guess like, what's your favorite dish over there? If people were to ever visit Cup of Peace, I mean, recommend them a certain yeah. uh, dish over there. Okay. So recently, actually like a food blogger in Denver, I think it's like Denver food page or something like that. They did like a TikTok on us about our rice paper burrito. Nice. So it's like a giant spring roll basically because it's made of like rice rice wrap and then you can they you can choose like uh beef, chicken or tofu and um and then it's like spicy or not and they add rice, vegetables. And so it's like basically like a big big spring roll. You can also get it on normal tortilla and make it like a burrito. But I think that one's really popular right now. And I did used to eat those a lot when I worked there. <laughs> yeah. What's in them? Um, so like a protein, so you know, uh chicken, beef, or tofu. Uh, and then you can add an egg if you want. Um, there's like a I think seven grain rice and then um salad mix, um, and then cheese. And, but you can take, you know, if you have an allergy, you can take these out. And then, um, also they give you like a hot sauce if you want that as well. Nice. I, would, I would even throw some kimchi in there. Hey, I know like <laughs> I'm a big fan of the kimchi scene. Um, I know with, um, what was it uh cream kimchi? I was a big fan, uh, back in the day mm. when, um, I, I think he is still around. I just haven't, uh, gone out to these farmer's markets these days and, you know, shame on me. Oh my gosh. I, I feel like I've been slacking <laughs> on the food market game. Um, but nonetheless, like I, I know with all the talks of kimchi, I know kimchi is a pretty popular dish and you know, like Korea and kimchi are usually in the same sentence. So what is kimchi for those that don't know what it is, Minju? Um, so it's like a, you know, it's a pantry staple. I feel like every Korean household has like kimchi olives in their fridge. Mm -hmm. It's fermented cabbage. That's spicy, spicy fermented cabbage. It's usually like the, the description, mm -hmm. but it has a lot of really good, like gut probiotics. Um, that says like, apparently that's like the, so it was really good against, I don't know how true this is, but the Koreans are claiming that it was really good against COVID. So okay. um, it's like this, I think it's counted as one of the seven superfoods of the world. So it's extremely healthy. Um, I think if you like pickles, you'll like it. Yeah. I am probably one of the only Koreans that don't like kimchi, <laughs> sadly. Yeah. <laughs> I do I do well, I will eat it cooked I yeah. just don't like it like cold from the fridge but mm -hmm. I I know that you know it's like an art and my mom makes it and Erland will get a jar from her like now and then so love it yeah, yeah. very healthy though I will say I know I know it's extremely healthy yeah okay she always gives me a jar when I go <laughs> <laughs> my mom yeah her mom yeah yes I dig it I mean um yeah I'm a big fan of the whole kimchi scene as well and I guess my Korean food love started over in the Mira Mesa area over in San Diego, where it's like very Asian cultured, um, influenced and all that good stuff. So there is a bibimbap over there. Like, is it the hot stone bowl or hot stone plate that, you know, you get the soup in there, you get some rice on the side, a uh, fried egg dumps them in there while the bowl is still hot and it fries the egg in there and all mm -hmm. that good stuff. I mean, I fell in love with it just because it was so tasty you know like there's all these oils and mm. sauces and everything like that and i would just dump my rice in there too at the same time so 
And I would put like four eggs in there. I mean, I'm a huge lover of eggs. I <laughs> don't want to see what my cholesterol is like at, the, at all. But nonetheless, <laughs> like that yeah. is that something you have over a cup of peas as well? They do have bibimbap. Um, they don't have the stone bowl, but it's more like, I think it's more like um, good for to-go's, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But they still have the, the vegetables and the rice and the egg and the sauce. So yeah, they still do have that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Excellent. No, that's... I, I'm glad we got to touch on the food scene a little bit because, I mean, there's something about the Denver scene that people just don't know about. And there's a lot more to, uh, I guess, the Denver scene for food is ever increasingly getting better. I know, uh, I remember mm -hmm. when people were talking about like the more of the locals that were here for like 10 years ago, they did not like Denver food. <laughs> like they would either oh, know yeah. their place and that's about it. And I can't attest to it at all. But honestly, I could say now being a newcomer to the place that I'm loving it. As long as you know your places and, you know, ask people like you guys, like, where should I eat? I mean, I know I'm going to have a good time, so I dig it. <laughs> so with that being said, I kind of want to go into one more sort of topic. I know you guys uh, purchased a house not too long ago, and that's where you guys are filming in, uh, over in the Westminster area. So really stoked that you guys are in like Westminster, not too far away from me, and you guys are homeowners as opposed to renters. I mean, me being a real estate agent, I could tell you all the benefits, but I won't bore you with all that stuff. So <laughs> what was that whole transition like? I mean, going from renting to being a homeowner and maybe even like the purchasing process for those that haven't bought or are still looking. PTSD. <laughs> we bought in one of like the toughest times i think this year like well, i mean everything right now is hard too with the interest rate but yeah. so we bought we actually uh are we closed on may 16th mm. so that was uh like in the height of you know when buyers did not have much power in the market definitely a seller's market things are going at least 50k if it felt like over asking price yeah. it was um it was like it became like we started looking in february and then went all the way that's when we closed in may and our lease was up in on june 1st mm. so if we didn't close um that week like like when we did that weekend then i don't think we would have i think we would have had to renew our lease for at least like a few months so yeah. it was like right at the very final stage um but it was like uh, so we, we kind of got this routine for the like the six weeks before, before we bought the house where like every weekend we would like make like four offers four or yeah. five offers maybe see like be between like 15 to 20 houses uh, mm -hmm. yeah it got to a point where i wasn't even i was working on weekends and so i wasn't even seeing the houses that we would offer on <laughs> minju minju would just go yeah. and say this house is nice i'll offer this much and that's actually how we landed this one i i didn't see it minju it was a throwaway offer you know it was it was okay, but it wasn't like, this is the house. We yeah. had like a couple of those, like, you know, um, but the, it, I honestly love, love what we ended up with, you know, yeah. nice. love the house, love the area. Westminster's very convenient. Yeah. Um, you know, also, yeah. Um, I think like, so yeah, I think when we first saw the house, we were kind of like, this could work. It's not like, we're not crazy, but about it. But then this price is like, you know, decent. If we, if they take this price, then we, it would become like a great house for us. For sure. And then thankfully um, we were working with OfferPad, which is not like a real live real estate agent. It's kind of like a company I'm sure, as Ian, you know, so um, that part was definitely like different because you know we couldn't get responses very fast yeah. so that part was different yeah. but um, it also helped to cut the emotion out of the situation yeah. like they they weren't emotional about the deal i felt like Business. we just wanted yeah we wanted to close they wanted to close so we ended up um, getting it at the at the price uh, i remember like we were terrified about the appraisal though because yeah. at that point appraisal gap was a huge issue with everyone because you can bid as high as you'd want but then we'd always be like oh my goodness we offered full gap coverage thankfully though we appraised like i think a little bit over so yeah. like that was really that was like when things started being like okay i think we can do this yeah, yeah. um but then after that um I, and then and then actually before i moved in we had to do a lot of work on the house yeah um there was a couple things that was wrong with it you know like uh for the biggest thing was a uh sewer issue mm. so the 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 pipe that went down into the street was offset and creating a massive sinkhole of garbage in our front yard. sewage into the front yard and so we when that was pointed out into the inspection i was you know we told them hey you know could we get some like credits for this and thankfully you know like 
Alfred Pad was like, yeah, go ahead. And there was a couple other things here and there, minor things that, you know, it was a flip, so it wasn't done the nicest. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it was kind of just like whatever. And uh, so they threw him some credits for that. Yeah. So That's... overall, like it was it was good. Yeah. And I think that like, I don't know, I think we love being homeowners. It's like the love best it. thing that we decided to do. And a lot of it actually was Ian, like yeah. Ian and Kat, you guys Props. Um, telling us that, yeah, this is like a good idea, you know, a great, a great decision to start into the like homeownership. And I think it makes a really, it's like really changed. I think how we look at like, you know, like um, building wealth mm. and financial like freedom eventually. And then also, um, also just like, uh, help other people. I, I think people around us also now we're gravitating more towards like other people who bought recently or like we're meeting people that also are looking to buy. Mm. So it's really interesting how like um, it, it does bring you to like a new community. Yeah, I think for sure. I have so much to talk about with you guys. <laughs> Those, I mean, like I love the story aspect of it. I feel like we've already talked about that a little bit, like even before this uh, podcast, I know we hang out like every once in a while and like, it's funny hearing your guys' story and journey, and that's the exact same mentality that I had and stressors that I had. And I was like, I have mm. no idea what I'm doing, but uh, I hear this is a good thing, right? <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad that you know we were able to guide you at least like emotionally uh, going into mm-hmm. the purchase of the property and like, yeah, I mean, I can go into statistics and everything, but I guess the one thing that I'll say is that like, for the average American, like median homeowner you know, uh, income person, um, like their, their wealth generator is their house and no Mm -hmm. other way can the average American can generate that kind of wealth as quickly or as assuredly over time, you know? So I'm Mm -hmm. glad that, you know, we, I guess, paved the way and sort of guided you, calmed your nerves along the way. So it's all part of that process and it's something that everyone goes through, you know? And now when you guys, if you guys go into your your next property anytime soon, you guys know what the process is like um, and what to expect going forward. If there's sewer issues, you know how much it is and all that good stuff. So, um, so as far as improvements, and what you plan on doing in the future. I know you guys haven't been in here for, what, not even six months yet uh, from what it sounds like. So uh, what do you guys have planned for the future with the home? Uh, I think the big ticket one is definitely the yard, the yeah. backyard. We The biggest one that we just finished was the, our, our living area. And so um, getting the kitchen set up, you know, the way we wanted it, painting all that stuff was done but yeah the biggest one is the backyard because right now it's like weeds dirt and dog poop mm. so yep gotta get back there you know mine looks yeah. exactly Those the are, same yeah. right, man <laughs> <laughs> we're waiting till next year i don't know yeah. if that's what you guys are doing as well yeah yeah it's yeah it's still uh, getting a little too cold now but yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was uh i was thinking uh, every once in a while to myself that like, Hey, what if I just put in the hard labor to till the place, you know, like get the reeds mm-hmm. out, get the grass out. Cause eventually we do want to like put in so much zero escape and little to no sprinklers yeah. involved with the whole thing, you know? So right, right. Um, I was trying to do it over the summer and I was like, man, it's freaking hot. And then now I'm thinking I'll just wait till winter time and I'll probably be like, it's too cold. (laughs) (laughs) So if anything, I might just like hire it out, you know, bite the bullet. Like, Hey, you guys are the professionals. You'll get it done twice as fast and twice as better looking than Mm -hmm. if I were to do it myself. So, uh, Mm -hmm. I know my limits and I'd rather hire that out. (laughs) Fair enough. Fair enough. (laughs) For sure. Well, Thank you so much for even being on the Invest in Denver podcast, guys. But I guess before I let you guys go, there's a couple things that I want you guys to be a part of. Number one being the turntables. We want to turn the tables. I feel like there should be a segment titled Better. I mean, I got to think about this later on. But like, I want to give you guys the mic and ask me anything you guys want. Um, I'll give you three questions, whatever you guys want to ask me. Okay. Okay. So for me, one of like the best things about Denver and like why... I think we ended up coming back after a while is the people. So I really like everyone that I like. I feel like I meet a lot of people that are similar to our mindset in Denver. Um, outdoorsy, friendly, um, but also like, you know, know how to have fun. But I'm curious as somebody who moved from San Diego, like what do you think the biggest difference is in like the people of San Diego and then the people of Denver? Your experience with meeting friends, you know, or people that even work 
Yeah, good question. Uh, it's funny when I was working my environmental consulting job in San Diego and I had a very similar job in Denver. So I worked with a lot of the same mm -hmm. like municipalities, same kind of people, same industry. Right. Mm -hmm. So over in the San Diego right. area, it was, I mean, sad to say, I know San Diego is very known for its laid backness and California right. vibes and things like that. But when it comes to work, there's still that like immediacy oh. that is almost required. Like, okay, let's cut to the chase here. You know, let's, let's, let's go on with our business. Like you you don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. <laughs> At least for <laughs> the work portion of it, you know, but like right, outside of right. that, you know, everyone loves just being outside and going to the beach, chilling with their dogs, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something for everyone in San Diego as well. But um, I guess the one alikeness before I get to the differences, the alikeness is that like, I didn't feel too far away from home as far as attitude goes when I moved to Denver. Um, there was mm. that West Coast attitude, but with the Midwest hospitality. That's what I like to tell people mm. about Denver. And people like to be a little bit more courteous here and ask about your day. And I was not used to that uh, over in the San Diego yeah. area, you know? Maybe it's like that LA influence or something like that, like going yeah, into San Diego. Yeah, I think so. Maybe. I'm not 100% sure. But I will say that like a lot of San Diegans, if they, were, if they are listening to this, um, might argue with me on that. Oh. But in general, um, compared to Denver especially, there is, I guess, a little bit more immediacy because I guess there's a lot to do in San Diego and maybe like there's places to be in San Diego mm -hmm. um, versus Denver. Like, hey, enjoy it. Like we're, we're here to have a good time and I, I want to get to know you a little bit better. So I... I wish that when I came here, COVID wasn't happening. I feel like I would have a lot yeah. more friends. Uh, but nonetheless, I I feel like I've integrated pretty well with the Denver scene. Yeah, for sure. I think, yeah, you're pretty active as well in the for community. For sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Way more so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, anything else? Okay. So, uh, you, I guess your age is 30. Are you 32? I'm is 33. That, right? 33. All right. So what would you say is like, what would you say is like the biggest like change in like how you think, I guess, even in like um, visiting a new city or even in like real estate, like in these first three years into your 30s rather than your last three years in your late 20s? Oh, yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, when I would go to new cities in my 20s, I would want to be um, like couch couch surfing um being close to all these like bars uh restaurants very walkable and i guess to to be honest like that is still something that i want to or want to do here in my 30s but in my 30s when i go to a new place now i look at the public transportation um i do not mm -hmm. want to drive and it's something that i judge a city on like i know with san francisco new york the the subway system, the BART, like everything about it is fantastic. And that's something that I would mm -hmm. love to, I guess, live one, at one point in my life, um, just in the heart of something, but very close to public transportation. And um, also what I've noticed too is time for myself. Like, where do I like to be alone at? You know, there's certain parts mm -hmm. of San Diego that um, if I were to go a couple hours northeast or east, like... I'm in the mountains, like even in uh, San Diego, like much smaller than the Rockies, but nonetheless, like I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying myself where I'm alone. And in my twenties, mm -hmm. that was not something that I was constantly thinking about. I wanted to be around people. I was very much more social. Um, so I don't know what it is. Maybe it is just me growing older and like, I guess wanting, I, I know as a real estate agent, my phone blows up all the time and I'm getting annoyed of it nowadays. But I mean, it means more business, but whatever, like I still want time for myself. So uh, for sure. I guess that's, that's what I've noticed too. Like even here in Denver, I guess that's another reason why I appreciate it so much is that I can be alone without feeling alone in a lot of places in Denver. Sounds almost philosophical, okay. but <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anything uh, else? If not, that's okay. Uh, I have I have a question. Yeah. yeah. So um, I know before you said that um, like because uh, you talk about being financially free, you know, and financial independence. Uh, and then so I'm just curious. You said that before. I think before you mentioned to us that like one of the things you want to do is live in Amsterdam. Um, 
when you when you have independence so um is there anywhere like do you have any is there anywhere else that you like would like to live after that like after having visited all these cities in the u.s yeah. any city like that 100 percent. yeah um yeah i guess for those that are not aware of what me and kat want to do we want to live in amsterdam for a year uh we did a euro trip and did like a smorgasbord of different uh European cities and towns and things like that. And we came across Amsterdam uh, specifically and just love the vibe. We love the public transportation. Uh, bikes are much more a plenty than cars. And we love that aspect about mm. it. So um, mm. I guess if there's any other places that we want to go for sure, it's definitely like South America in general. Like I have an affinity towards yeah. Latin American uh, cultures and the language itself. Like I love Spanish maybe because I grew up in San Diego, but <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> I enjoy it wholeheartedly. I love the family aspect of it, the culture aspect of it. Um, and uh, Chile and Argentina, um, especially the Patagonia area, like the very Southern tip is something that Kat and I mm. want to explore definitely in our near future. Um, so uh, I think it also pertains to that same thing that I said before, of like being alone without feeling alone. So having that rain shadow, like just east of Chile, like where the Andes are, the, one of the largest deserts over there. I forgot what the desert's name is, but um, I always wanted to check that out and see what the salt flats are like and just feel like Mm -hmm. I'm the only one here. This feels fantastic, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. anything where I just feel alone, well, I guess be alone, not feel alone. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, if you ever want to feel super crowded, I would love if we all went to like Korea. Hey. <laughs> if you guys want to. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, Opposite of alone though, you know, <laughs> super packed. Stacked. Yeah. Sardines. No, dude, for real. Uh, so I've never been to like the East Asia countries before, you know, like maybe yeah. just the Philippines. I mean, that was when I was a kid. Oh, okay. But uh, like Korea, mm -hmm. like I I would definitely enjoy Korea and, and seeing what That'd the scene is like. Cool. And myself being an avid video gamer, uh, I want to see what that video oh. game scene as well. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Fastest Wi-Fi in the world. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it already. <laughs> <laughs> well thanks so much guys thanks for hanging out and uh, you know i love the intro as well by by the way um as far as if anyone were to reach out to you guys i know you guys are very involved in the denver community whether that's salsa sports going out with tori things like that uh if anyone were to reach out to you guys for more tips and tricks about the whole denver area how can they reach you all okay yeah so i'm on instagram you can reach me there and it's at Minju, so M I N J U M U S S. Awesome. Nice. And Erland will follow in suit with whatever Minju says or receives. <laughs> I'm always there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice for sure. And I myself, I'm at Ian.realestateagent. I'm very active on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. Uh, feel free to follow me and subscribe and all that good stuff because I post things twice a week this will go on the website and the youtube channel as well as like these weekly vlog tours of like how to house hack in denver and all that good stuff and i'm pretty active in that regard i'm part of the fight team and this production itself is a fight team production and hosted by me yours truly ian humano and i am a servant to you the denver people so thank you so much minju and erland for hanging out with me and i'll see y'all later sounds good thanks ian thank you <laughs>